Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't God good? Amen. What an honor for me to be here. The, uh, I'll just tell you, we love your pastor and his wife. And if we could, if we could, next time they come, I just, I'd take their passport so they can't get back out of the country. But I wouldn't do that to y'all, but I want you to know how much we appreciate them. And uh, we've actually had them in Halifax twice. The first time they came through, uh, they were preaching in the area, and they just took the effort upon themselves to come and visit us in Halifax. And we thought, you know what, these people are so great, uh, we need to get them back so our church can experience their ministry. And so <clears throat> back in February of 2013, they, they joined us for a weekend, and we just had a tremendous time with them. And Lord willing, we're going to have them back sometime in the not-too-distant future. But it is an honor for me to be here. The, uh, I have looked forward to this since we uh, knew I would be in the area and contacted your pastor, and he extended the invitation. Um, I just think it's incredible the way God has smiled upon this church and this area of the country. Um, I think it's just incredible. But I believe God has greater things to do. Amen. Amen. I want to be respectful of your time tonight, but I do want to share the word of the Lord with you. So if you have your Bible, uh, you can grab it real quickly. We're going to go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 2. My wife just texted me a picture during the, just a few minutes into service. She began a ladies Bible study. The Lord laid it upon her heart that sometimes women, especially in a church plant with limited resources and no nursery and things like that, that sometimes women are so preoccupied with their children that they don't get the full benefit of a church service. And so uh, the Lord laid it upon her heart a couple months ago to begin a, a women's Bible study. And she did that, and so the, typically it's the last third or fourth uh, Wednesday evening of every month. Uh, she does that, and I believe tonight was their third lesson, and she's just shy of 15 people in every women's Bible study. So she was ecstatic tonight. As she was the last time, God has blessed that. We've actually got some women who are connecting with one church through that Bible study that have never darkened the doors on a Sunday morning. So we're excited about what the Lord is doing. And uh, amen. God is just good. There are a couple of familiar faces here. Um, I don't see them at the moment, but Brent Wycliffe, right there in the back. We actually attended the same Bible school. I was a year, two years, you think a year ahead of him, two years ahead of him. And so we were there for one year at the same time. And Brother Shirley probably wouldn't, he may not remember my face, but he actually made several trips to the Bible school while I was there. And we actually have a very good mutual friend, Jeremy and Katie Duran. They, uh, Jeremy is from the province of Ontario. His wife, Katie, was from uh, Portland, Oregon. They were just married a couple weeks ago, and they're going to be joining us in the city of Halifax uh, next week, actually. And that's where they're going to embark on their new life together, so we're excited to have them with us. And, Amen. Let's turn to the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read two verses of scripture. Verses 4 and 5. The Apostle Paul writes, In my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration. Somebody say the word demonstration. Of the spirit and of power. It continues in verse 5, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And with the Lord's help tonight, I want to talk to you for a few minutes on this subject, apostolic demonstration. Apostolic demonstration. Why don't we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for your awesome presence that we sense in this sanctuary. I pray you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. Let the Word of God talk to our hearts tonight. Bless the preaching of your Word. And everybody said in Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. Apostolic demonstration. It's from the book of 1 Corinthians. The city of Corinth was a peninsula of sorts that connected it with the rest of the known world. The sea was a cause for high traffic in the region. Because of its virtue of the water, it became a place where many cultures and religions could mingle. The influence of polytheistic ideas was very evident if you were to study its history. Somewhat similar to Western society, but somewhat different. It's become apparent in the past few decades of North America that they're trying to push faith into the realm of, of privacy. They try to take its influence out of the public. Well, Corinth was much different. 
faith was very much a public thing. And if you were to walk the city streets of Corinth, you would see buildings that were covered in idols. And the streets were just filled with what would have been expression of religious worship. Though it was false in its theology, it was worship nonetheless. It was integrated into the government, into the social life. It was very much in the, built into the everyday life of the city of Corinth. And given its position on the sea, they had what we would understand, and we see this quite often, particularly in the summer months in the city of Halifax, we call them buskers. They're people who align the boardwalk, and whatever talent they feel they may have, they're going to show it off in hopes to make a living. We've got people who will juggle and, and sing and play music and draw pictures and paint. They do all kinds of things. Well, Corinth was known for one thing in particular. They had professional orators much like we would look at someone who is a modern self-help guru. Men in Corinth would line the streets of the downtown of that city, and they would begin to charge admission to their presentation. When people would come into these presentations, they would, through uh, rhetorical speeches and their infamous oratory, they would begin to sell their ideas to the city of Corinth. And understanding that background, Paul's words begin to mean something a little more to us, because... It becomes evident that through Paul's writing and through his language, what he was saying was actually to set himself up in direct contradiction to the cultural customs of his day. I think it's important for us to understand where Paul is at and where the church of Corinth is at at the time of his writing. He had first traveled to the city of Corinth accompanied by two Jewish tent makers, Aquila and Priscilla. He invested 18 months of ministry into this city in the early A.D. 50s. And following his departure from there and a few stops, he comes to the city called Ephesus. And it's from this place in Ephesus he now writes a letter back to the church at Corinth. If you read First and Second Corinthians, you'll quickly come to the conclusion that there were some problems in the church. And Paul writes to address those problems. And I, I think at the, at the center of that was that they were departing from what established them as a church in the beginning. And I think that's why in the opening chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to draw their attention back to the source of every church, the power of God. And so in these troubling matters, Paul is moved by the Spirit to write this letter and remind them of how it all came to be. 1 Corinthians 2, the opening verses of that chapter say, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now you've got to understand, Paul is speaking to people who were used to having professional orators and people who would give speeches for a living and sell admission to performances. Paul is speaking to these people who have built their living and their reputation on their knowledge, on their wisdom, and on their ability to speak. And Paul writes and he says, when I came to you, I wasn't like everybody else. When I came to you, my ministry, it was not founded upon my ability to speak. It wasn't upon my intellect or my knowledge. I didn't want to know anything save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He continues, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. So Paul is really, he's given us an insight into his condition. As a matter of fact, I think Paul says, I I was a little bit timid. I I I was a little bit afraid because I recognized what was normal to you and what culture painted as the expectation to you. And Paul, I I didn't match that. But Paul lets them know, in my speech... And my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I think when Paul uses this word determine, we can come to one of two conclusions. Either Paul has in his past unsuccessfully attempted another form of ministry, or he has through careful reflection come to the conclusion that there really is no ministry outside the power of the Holy Ghost. I lean towards the idea because I believe if you trace the footsteps of Paul, you would find that in Acts 17, when he preaches in a place called Mars Hill, he takes what I think we could call a somewhat of a philosophical approach. We see him using literature and poets that were known to the Grecian people of that day. But it's striking that Paul doesn't reap the kind of harvest in Mars Hill that he does in Corinth. 
And following his departure from Mars Hill, I, I believe the next place you'll find he goes is the city of Corinth, the people that he now writes to. And could it be that after trying a somewhat philosophical approach to ministry, Paul recognized, you know what? What I really need is the power of the Holy Ghost. And so Paul writes to them and reminds them that what established this church in the first place and what was the life source of this church in the beginning must still be the life of this church. And he draws their attention back to the power of God. That word demonstration. It shares the root word for demonstrative. And I understand in our context, demonstrative can somewhat be a, an in-your-face kind of word. But it simply means a vibrant or a fervent expression of emotion. And in the Greek, that word literally means a showing off. And so what Paul was writing to them was, when I came to you, my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the showing off of the Spirit and of power. In other words, Paul said, I didn't have to sell you tickets. I didn't have to convince you to come to my show because when I opened my mouth and when I started preaching, the Spirit itself began to show off its power to the people. And so that gives us a little bit of understanding about Paul's strategy or his perspective of ministry in the city of Corinth. And let me just say at the onset here that if Jesus Himself could tell His disciples all power in heaven and earth is given unto me, that I want to do whatever I can do to position myself to benefit from the fact that He has all power. Amen? And so what does it mean for us to experience apostolic demonstration? I understand in the 21st century we can throw words around and not fully understand or comprehend the depth of their meaning. And I think apostolic is one of those words. It can kind of be thrown around loosely and we not really fully comprehend what it means to be apostolic. And so tonight when I say apostolic demonstration, what I mean is we are like the apostles. To claim that title, apostolic, means I can trace my doctrine, that is what I teach, and my experience, that is what I do, all the way back to the apostles. I don't look just back 500 years into history or, or 100 years, I go all the way back to the apostles. And that is where we come from. And so when I say apostolic demonstration, what I mean is the way the Spirit of God showed off through the life and the ministry of the apostles. By the Spirit of God, it can happen through us in 2014. The same way the apostles experienced apostolic demonstration, the church of Jesus Christ in 2014 can position itself to experience that still. And so we all get on the same page, and we all understand what that looks like. Let's just briefly run through the book of Acts and get a taste of what apostolic demonstration looks like. In Acts chapter 2, when a group of people were in the upper room praying, at first, 120 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And from that demonstration of the Spirit, the Scripture lets us know 3,000 people were baptized in the same day. The next chapter in the book of Acts, their disciples are on the way to the temple at the hour of prayer. They come to the gate called Beautiful and find a lame man laying there, asking alms of them. The Bible says he looks at them expecting to receive something. That disciple of Jesus looks down, he says, Sir, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have given unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The Bible says that man got up to his feet and went leaping and dancing into the temple. That, my friend, is apostolic demonstration. In Acts chapter 4, Peter is in custody, but while in prison, he preaches to the political leaders of his day. That, my friend, is apostolic demonstration. In Acts chapter 5, Peter is just walking down the street when the shadow of the apostle healed a lame man. That is apostolic demonstration. Acts chapter 6, the Bible says Stephen was full of faith and power and wrought miracles among the people. Acts chapter 7, Stephen 
prior to his death, preaches to some of the most influential people of his day. Acts chapter 8, Samaritans receive the Holy Ghost. Philip converts an Ethiopian. Acts chapter 9, God breaks the hardness on the heart of Saul, calls him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches to the Gentiles, and they too receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is apostolic demonstration. Acts chapter 11, Peter explains how the church continued to grow even while persecuted. Acts chapter 12, Peter is miraculously delivered from the deepest cells of a prison. Acts 13, Paul preaches to tens of thousands of people in the city of Antioch. The Bible says, and the entire city came to hear him. Acts chapter 14, in Lystra, a man who was lame from birth is healed by God. Acts chapter 15, internal conflict is resolved with grace, mercy, and truth. In Acts 16, Lydia and her household are converted while another man is delivered. In Acts 17, Paul preaches in Mars Hill, the seat of evil influence in that region of the world. In Acts chapter 18, the preaching of Paul converts Crispus, a religious leader, in false doctrine. In Acts 19, John, the disciples of John, pardon me, receive the preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified by the Paul and are born of water and of spirit. This is just a taste of some of the things we can find in the book of Acts that let us know what it looks like when the Spirit of God begins to show off through His people. But, now lest we become misled in our pursuit of apostolic demonstration, we must understand this that apostolic demonstration only occurs where apostolic doctrine is preached. And I know you're in a series talking about many of these things. And I didn't know this when I intended to preach this. But apostolic demonstration only happens where apostolic doctrine is preached. You say, what does that look like? This is what it looks like here O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is only one God. And the New Testament lets us know, for God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, preached unto Gentiles, received up into glory, believed on in the world, that that same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Bible said God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. When you see Jesus, you're not seeing one part of God. You're not seeing one piece of God or one person of God. The Bible said, and in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so if we pursue apostolic demonstration this much, we must understand. We must preach the oneness of God. That Jesus Christ is the very express image of God. And if we want to come into relationship with that one true God, that we've got to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that presupposes the resurrection of Jesus Christ because Paul said, if He be not risen, our faith and our preaching is in vain. And so when we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, like Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this same Jesus whom you have crucified, God hath raised up. This same Jesus is both Lord and Christ. He's seated at the right hand of God, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, hath poured it out which ye now see and hear. And Peter begins to preach that to the people. And the Spirit of God started working on him. And all of a sudden the Bible says one of them piped up and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And I can imagine by that point, Peter was just about ready to come over the pulpit. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so if you want to come into covenant with that one true God, there's only one way in. As He, was, as he died, was buried, and rose again in repentance, His death becomes our death. And in baptism, 
baptism, his burial becomes my burial. And when I receive the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, if you have received the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that same Spirit shall quicken your mortal bodies. I'm thankful that we know that this one true God has gone to great lengths to make salvation available. Repentance. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. My friends, there is nothing to preach but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if we'll just preach it everywhere we go, demonstration will follow. When you find Samaritans who've got a little Jewish history and a little Gentile they're kind of like people who, you know, they believe the Bible is the Word of God. They believe in Jesus, but they're not quite in the apostles' doctrine. But you know what you preach to them? The Bible says they preach to them concerning the kingdom of God. And the Holy Ghost began to fall. They baptized them in the name of Jesus, prayed them through to the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because if we'll preach the apostles' doctrine, we will experience apostolic demonstration. Acts chapter 10, they're preaching to the Gentiles. You know what the Bible says? While he spake these words. He didn't even get through the sermon. Because when you preach the apostles' doctrine, apostolic demonstration will follow. While he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. And they began to speak in other tongues. It happens when you preach apostolic doctrine. There is no other message to preach than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if you want to come into covenant, if you want to come into relationship with this same Jesus that the apostles preached, my friend, there is only one way in, and it is through repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you'll just yield your heart to the Lord, He will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the apostles' doctrine. And if we'll preach it, will experience apostolic demonstration. But I think it's possible to preach the Apostles' Doctrine and not fully experience the dimension of demonstration God makes available. And so the question for us is this. While adhering to the doctrine, what must we do to position ourselves to partake of all power in heaven and in earth. Number one, I would say, is we must want it. There's got to be something inside of us that is determined to experience it. Jesus gathered His disciples on the side of a hill and said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst. Now, I learned something about hunger when my wife was pregnant for our first child. At 11.30 one night, she decided she needed a red delicious apple. I said, honey, it's 11.30. I know, but the superstore's open 24 hours a day. Haley, really, it's 11.30. I know, but I really need an apple. Honey, there is a fridge full of food in our kitchen. There are our cupboards full of good things. But I really need a red delicious apple. So about midnight, I slipped my coat on, I got in the vehicle, and I head to the grocery store. Because when you get hungry, you won't be determined with anything else. And while we're preaching the apostles' doctrine, what God is wondering is if I look down on New Life in Cabot, Arkansas, will I find somebody who is hungry for demonstration? When I look upon this house, God is wondering, will I find somebody who will not be determined with anything but apostolic demonstration? Can I find a people who will be some come so discontented with church when the waters of baptism aren't troubled? Can I find people who will absolutely refuse to go week after week and not see people fill with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Will I find a people in the city of Cabot who will just say, I'm hungry for the miraculous. I'm hungry 
hungry for demonstration. I'm hungry for the lost to be saved. I'm hungry to see God open the blind eye. I'm hungry to see the deaf ear. I'm, I'm hungry for I'm hungry for I'm hungry for Because if you get hungry, you will refuse to stop at anything short of that which you're hungry for. It doesn't matter how much it inconveniences you. It doesn't matter how difficult it is or how high the cot when you get hungry. You're willing to do whatever it is you've got to do to get what you're hungry for. You'll get up at midnight, you'll get dressed, and you'll drive to the superstore. Or you'll roll out of bed at 2 or 3 in the morning when the Spirit of the Lord moves on you and fall on your knees and begin to cry out to God because you're hungry for it. You're hungry for it. When you're hungry for apostolic demonstration, there is a promise in the Word of God that all power in heaven and earth is available to us. But we've got to be hungry for it. We've got to desire it. There's got to be something within us that drives us to places of commitment and pushes us into places of consecration where we get hungry and we cry out to God. We say, Jesus, I refuse to be satisfied with anything but the demonstration of Your Spirit. We've got to want it. We've got to want it. A little while ago, God began to convict me about my attitude towards church on Sunday morning. I found myself kind of getting a little bit of a rut where I would just go and I didn't have specific expectation for what I wanted God to do. I just strolled into church, went through the routine of setting up, open service, sing to the songs, preach the word, and hope God did something. And God began to convict with me. And he asked me one morning in prayer, Dan, what are you hungry for? We've got to want it. And number two is we've got to pray for it. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up in verse number 14, speaking of those who had been in the upper room. He writes, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. These all continued with one accord in prayer and in supplication. And the true mark of hunger is prayer. Because when you begin to get hungry for it, you will begin to pray for it. You will be driven to pray. Now what I find incredible about the whole experience in the upper room is when Jesus is standing in a place called Bethany, the Bible lets us know there was a crowd of 500 people. But somewhere between Bethany and Jerusalem, 500 became 120. Now I don't know if some of them decided at Bethany it's just not worth the trip. I don't know if somewhere on the journey they got tired, hungry, or distracted. Maybe some of them even got to the upper room. But on day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, they left. But on day number ten, those who had continued in prayer experienced something unlike nothing they had ever experienced before. They witnessed the demonstration of the Spirit. Now somebody hear me tonight. I don't know if you're at Bethany. I don't know if you're in Jerusalem. I don't know if you're in the upper room. I don't know if you've been waiting one day, five days, nine days. But if you're hungry for it, just keep praying. You might have needs in your life you've been praying for for days, weeks, months, or years. But don't allow your hunger to diminish. Just keep praying praying. Just keep praying. And you know what the best thing you can do is? Is find some people, pull them up alongside of you and say, hey, would you just continue with me in prayer and just keep praying. Pray in the morning. Pray in the noontime. Pray, in, pray all day long. Just keep 
praying because when you get hungry, that hunger will drive you to do things and to sacrifice in ways that those who are hungry will not. So take that hunger for demonstration. Let it drive you into the place of prayer and begin to cry out to God. I'm sure we've got needs in this room, family and friends who are not saved. Let that hunger push you into a place of prayer. Gather them near to you and with one accord, just continue in prayer until it happens. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. When it's hard, pray. When you're tired, pray. When you're weak, pray. When you're discouraged, pray. Just keep praying. Whatever you don't quit praying. Pray, 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 pray. You say, that sounds hard. Some days it is. But just keep praying because sooner or later, the God of all promises is going to hear that prayer and is going to turn that around because you are moved by hunger. But I think we can want it and we can pray for it and still not receive it unless, number three, we are open to it. This dawned on me a little while ago because being around Pentecost, we just get, we get accustomed to this. We just anticipate that when I show up to church, we're going to hear somebody talk in tongues. In Acts chapter 2, nobody had ever talked in tongues. Now you might be able to make a small case from Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that they had some idea of what might happen. But even that, I think there's a lot of questions. All they know is Jesus said to this crowd at Bethany, go to Jerusalem and tarry there for the promise of the Father until you be endued with power from on high. All they knew is we need to get to Jerusalem and we need to start tarrying because the God of all promises has spoken His word. And so there they are in the upper room Ten days, tearing, praying, crying out to God. I have no idea what they expected. But it's pretty safe to say what happened that day probably came as a little bit of a surprise. But they were open to what was unknown to them. And because they were hungry, and because they were praying, and because they were open to it, when that power showed up, they experienced a demonstration of the Spirit that nobody had ever seen before. And the Bible said they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. The sound of wind began to blow through that room. Cloven tongues of fire appeared upon each of them. There was something supernatural that happened in that room. And as uncomfortable as it might have been, as unknown as it was, as unfamiliar as it was, they were open to an experience that they had never had before. And if we're going to experience the demonstration of the Spirit that is available to us by way of the Holy Ghost. We've got to get hungry. We've got to pray. And we have got to be open to it. We have got to be open to it. We had a girl in our church. I was telling your pastor today. Her name was Chi. She came from Zimbabwe, attending university in the city of Halifax. I'll never forget last July, the third Sunday of July. She sat about two rows from the front, right about here. and We were just worshiping. We were singing. God was moving. And all of a sudden, I could hear. I was just about a foot behind her running the computer. I could hear somebody begin to speak in other tongues. And I thought it was Rumi, another young girl from the country of Zimbabwe. And I thought in my head, man, Rumi's really she's breaking through today. This is good. Until I looked to the front, and I saw my wife and Pastor Justin's wife kind of looking at each other with a smile from ear to ear. Pastor Justin and I made eye contact and he pointed at Chi. And I realized that God had just filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Nobody laid hands on her. Nobody was coaching her. She was just worshiping. 
She later told me, she said, I wasn't even praying for the Holy Ghost. I was just worshiping. I was just talking to God. But she was open to the moving of the Spirit. And that same power that fell in the upper room fell at 1673 Barrington Street in the city of Halifax. Because if we'll get hungry, and if we'll pray, and if we'll just open ourselves to it, God will pour out His Spirit. Now what was even more incredible to me, she said, Pastor Dan, it was the most incredible thing. She had grown up in, in a background in a church that, that taught the Holy Ghost wasn't even an experience in the 21st century. And she said, it was the most incredible thing. I was just worshiping. And all of a sudden, I felt the breeze. And she said, when I felt that wind touch my body, I began to speak in other tongues. And it was about 30 seconds after that that Pastor Justin had picked up the microphone and said, Church, I feel like the wind of the Holy Ghost is about to blow through this place. And God was just confirming His Word and His experience to that young girl. Hear me today. If we'll get hungry for the things of the Spirit and we'll begin to cry out to God and make ourselves available, then God will show up. And by His Spirit, He will begin to show off. All we've got to do is be open to it. Just be open to it. Want it. Get hungry for it. Pray for it. And be open to it. Number four, I know your pastor does it, and I know this church is hearing it over the next several weeks, is we must preach it. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter began to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, conviction moved, and the Bible said, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, you've got to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But he continued in verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. All that are afar off in geography and in time. Peter stood up that day. It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem, if you're in Samaria, if you're in Corinth or Ephesus, you can go into Africa, Asia Minor, or you can look ahead to 2014 in the city of Halifax or Cabot, Arkansas. God is still pouring out the Holy Ghost if we will preach it. And so without fear or favor, let us rise to the occasion and let everybody know that the same Jesus the apostles walked with, the same Jesus the apostles preached, is alive and well and is pouring out His Spirit to those who will preach His Word. And so I'm asking us tonight, will we get hungry for it? Will we begin to pray for it? Will we begin to be open to it and make ourselves available? Will we rise to the occasion and preach it? Preach it to our friends. Preach it to our family. Preach it to our co-workers. Preach it to everybody you know. Preach it to your waitress. Preach it, preach it everywhere and to everyone. Because if we'll preach it, God will confirm His Word. And the fifth thing is we must go. Because the apostolic pattern was not call them, it was go to them. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven in Mark chapter 16, the Bible said, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. If you're ever wondering what to preach, preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel. You say, well, that sounds so simple. Just preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. Not he that is baptized. Pardon me. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so the emphasis was on belief leading to baptism and to salvation. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, now notice this, shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. 
They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, verse 19, after the Lord had spoken unto them, He was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth. This tells me that every experience with God, every time we hear the word of the Lord, the proper response is to rise from our seats and to go forth and preach everywhere. And the Bible says, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And so to follow the apostolic pattern, we must rise, go, and preach, recognizing that if we preach the Word, God has shown us He will work with us. He will come alongside of us. And He will confirm His Word. And So this lets me know a few things. The absence of apostolic demonstration causes me to ask myself this. Am I going? Am I preaching? What am I preaching? Because if I go, if I preach the Word, God confirms His Word with signs following. We must get hungry for it. We must desire it. We must pray for it. We must be open to it. As unfamiliar as it could be, as uncomfortable as it may be, we must be open to it. We must preach it, and we must go. I believe that is the method to experience apostolic demonstration. If your music wants to come back, we're going to get ready to close in a moment. But this is the formula for apostolic demonstration. And if we will do it, I'm confident. I am confident that God will confirm His Word. I've just, seen, I've just seen God do too many things. When my father was 14 years old, he was on the way to a potato field on a Saturday morning riding his little motorbike. They didn't wear helmets back then. And you guys don't have to wear helmets anyway down here. But at home you have to wear a helmet. On the way to the potato field on a Saturday morning, we're going through an intersection, a potato truck ran a stop sign, hit my father at 14 years of age. Spent two and a half months in a coma, in a hospital bed. And finally, after about it was 80 days, I think it was, 85 days, the doctor came in and told my grandparents, Simon, Eva, there's really nothing more we can do. If David is to live how he is right now is really, that, that, that's the remainder of his life. And we're suggesting that, that given the hardship of keeping your family with the state he would be in, the doctors suggested to my grandparents that they take him off life support. And if he lives, he lives. If he dies, he dies. My Grammy, she was a, I don't have many memories of her. She died when I was just a young boy, but my family tells me she was a praying woman. She said, Doctor, give us just a couple more days because after church on Sunday, I want to get our pastor to come on in here one more time and we're going to pray and see if God will raise David up. The preacher walked in there Sunday afternoon put a little oil on his finger took a hold of my father's hand and said David McLeod by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ I speak healing into your body rise up and walk my father's eyes opened and it was just a week later he walked out of that hospital and I'm here because God is a healer this is apostolic demonstration this is apostolic demonstration. My mother was four and a half months pregnant with me. She went to a service on a Sunday night in Fredericton, New Brunswick within the summer of 1988. Just the week prior to that, the doctor had informed her after the ultrasound 
that I had a baseball-sized tumor growing on the side of my head. It was larger than my head at the time. The doctor said, Nancy, you really have one of two options. You can try to go ahead with this pregnancy, and most likely your child will die, and you'll put your own life in risk. Or you can abort this baby and save yourself. My mother went to church that Sunday night in Fredericton, New Brunswick. The preacher walked in off the platform and kind of waited out in the middle of the aisle. He said, I don't know who this is or what this situation is, but I feel like there's somebody sitting in this area of the church. And you just received news that, that, that your life and, and maybe another life are in jeopardy. And I've come to tell you that the Lord has already taken care of it. She returned to the doctor the following week. They sent her in for an ultrasound. And that tumor had completely detached from the side of my head. Just four years ago, my mother underwent a surgery, a procedure she needed done. And inside of her body was that shriveled up, dead tumor. The doctor took it out and said, what's this? She said, I'll tell you what that is. Because apostolic demonstration is available to us. It is available to us. Let's stand tonight. It is available to us. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. It doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter what needs are before us. Because he has all power. A crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, that's all right. I've got power over your infirmity. Blind eyes, that's okay. Because I've got power over blindness. Deaf ears, all power. Even Lazarus, who has been dead, buried, put in the tomb. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Unsaved spouses. All power. Parents that aren't All power. Financial difficulty. All power. I've come to tell you tonight that the Lord Jesus Christ is not intimidated by your situation. He has all power in heaven and earth. And if He can look upon this house and find somebody with enough hunger to drive them into a place of prayer, to put you into a place of openness, that the God of all glory, the God of all power, the Lord Jesus Himself can show up in your life and demonstrate His power in your situation. All power in heaven and earth. He can restore your marriage. He can bring back everything you thought you lost. He is a God of restoration. He is a God of healing. He is a God of salvation. And what our religious world needs is an awakening of demonstration. In 1 Kings, that story of the old prophet Elijah climbs the top of Mount Carmel. He is on one side and on the other side several hundred false prophets of Baal. And the deal was made. You prepare your sacrifice and I'll prepare mine. And let the God who answers by fire, let Him be God. The Bible said those false prophets of Baal fixed themselves a sacrifice. They begin to dance and shout. They begin to cut them. They, the most unusual things. If you would allow me to liken the analogy of dancing and shouting. It speaks to me of Christianity in the 21st century. Presentation. Presentation. Which is not bad, but if it's what your trust is in, you'll come up empty-handed. And so as they dance and they shout, nothing happens. And as they cry out, God of Baal, Astaroth, 
no fire, no evidence, no power. And the Bible says at midday, and this is what that tells me, what was false had occupied most of the day. At midday, Elijah figured it's time I step up to this altar. Fix myself a sacrifice. He turned to those servants and said, fetch me some water. You've got to understand, there was a drought in the land. Going and fetching yourself some water and bringing it up that mountainside was a high sacrifice. Fetch me some water. And he drenches that. Dug ditches around the altar. And they filled with water. It speaks volumes to me that the prophet was willing to drench that altar in the most precious commodity in the land. What there was a famine of is what he was willing to sacrifice. When he drenched that sacrifice in a short 63 words, fire. Consume the sacrifice, the water, and the altar. Whew. And what they couldn't do in most of the day, Elijah's God had done in a moment. And in a religious world that is so much like Corinth, that's mingled with cultures and ideologies and philosophies, what we really need is a people to rise up who say, I'm hungry for apostolic demonstration. And when that fire fell, the people cried out, Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. And they begin to cry out, The Lord, He is God. Jehovah, He is God. Because the Spirit itself demonstrated His power. Presentation in and of itself is not bad. But if you think dancing and shouting and present screens lights this is a beautiful building but this in and of itself will not bring power the likelihood is is the resources of this church will never match some churches but that's okay because our trust is not in resources but if we'll drench our altar with the most precious commodity in the land if we'll prepare our sacrifice and pray and pray and pray. Whew. A fire from heaven will fall. Whew. Open blind eyes. Whew. Unstop deaf ears. Whew. Bring financial miracles. Whew. Restore marriages. Whew. There's no limit to what can happen when the Spirit of God begins to bear witness of its power. And when it happens, what's going to happen is the city of Cabot, every stronghold, every false idea, every philosophy, they'll fall and they'll look upon the people who have power with God and begin to cry out, Jesus, He is God. Jesus, He is God. Jesus, He is God. I'm preaching tonight that there is apostolic demonstration available to the people of the Most High God. Why don't we lift our hands tonight and open our mouth and begin to cry out to God, Jesus, 
Come on, there's some people in this place tonight. You've got situations in your life. You've got spouses who aren't saved. Parents who aren't saved. You've got alcoholics in your family. Drug addicts in your family. Come on, there's a power available to us. The people of the name, a people of covenant, prepare your altar. Prepare your sacrifice. Come on, it's about midday right now. It's about midday. Oh, Jesus. 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 Come on, over the next few weeks, when we lift up the name, when we preach the apostles' doctrine, we've got to prepare ourselves for the demonstration of the Spirit. There's going to be signs. There's going to be wonders. Oh, come on, be open to it. Be open to it. Let the Spirit of the Lord begin to move on you. Pray through you. Work through you. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, yeah. In the name of Jesus. Oh, come on. Let that hunger rise up. Let that hunger rise up. Let that hunger rise up. Oh, yeah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, oh the Spirit itself. The Spirit itself for my preaching. My speech was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, great God of heaven. Great God of heaven. Great God of heaven. Oh, we need you. We need you. I know it's Wednesday night. I'm not sure what your, what your custom is, but I wonder if there's anybody in here tonight that says, you know what, I've got, I've got a need in my life. I've got something specific in my life I need the Lord to intervene in. It's going to take something more than presentation and program. I need a, a touch of His power. Because I'm telling you, in this house where apostolic doctrine is preached, God is desiring to confirm His Word with signs following. And I would go so far as to tell you that prepare yourselves. Because over the next three Sundays, I believe the windows of heaven are about to be opened upon this house. God is getting ready to pour out a blessing that you can't contain. I believe God is getting ready to confirm His Word unlike never before. If you know sick people, this Sunday would be a great weekend to bring them to church. Because when the name of Jesus is preached, I've just got to feel Him that the gift of healing could sweep through this house and God could confirm His Word. If you know marriages that need restored, I'm telling you, God's raising up a church in Cabot where families can be strengthened by the power of the name of Jesus. But if you're in this house tonight and there's a specific need in your life, I'm going to invite you to just step out and we're going to pray. In one mind, and one accord, we're going to lift our voice and call on the name of Jesus and just see if the Spirit will demonstrate His power in this place tonight. If you've got a need tonight, why don't you just step out? We're going to gather at the front and we're going to lift our voices and ask the Lord to confirm His Word with signs following. Oh yes. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, we got to get hungry. And we've got to pray. We've got to make ourselves open to it. And when we do, prepare yourselves for the God of heaven to move amongst His people and confirm His Word with signs following. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray right now, God, that Your power would move upon us. 
that those with infirmity in their body, by the authority of the name of Jesus, by the stripes upon your back, by the blood that you shed, we speak healing virtue upon the sick in this place right now. We speak healing in the name of Jesus. We speak peace to the troubled mind. We speak against anxiety. We speak against depression by the authority of the name Jesus. We speak healing to relationship. We speak peace to conflict in the name of Jesus. You are our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God our provider, the God of all provision. I speak against poverty. I speak against financial oppression. I pray that you would open the windows of heaven, that you would pour out a blessing upon this house for their covenant and their giving unto you. I pray God that you would pour out blessing that we cannot contain in the name of Jesus. This is a covenant people God. This is a covenant house. And I pray you would show yourself strong. Woo! Woo! In the name of Jesus. God raise up this church as a church of demonstration in the city of Cabot. When people are diagnosed with cancer, let them say, I'm going to new life to be healed by the name of Jesus. Woo! Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I feel the Holy Ghost in here tonight. I know it's a midweek, but the Lord is confirming His Word. Oh, yes. It might be new to you. It might be unusual to you, but don't allow what is unknown and maybe a little bit uncomfortable to keep you from stepping in and experiencing the power of the Lord Jesus. Oh, yeah. In the name of the Lord. He's got power over diabetes. He's got power over every disease. He's got power over arthritis. He can touch your bones. He can touch your back. He can make you whole in this house because He is the God of demonstration. This same Jesus. Oh, yeah. 